Good morning, my name's Mark Hadley and I'll be taking us through the reading this morning. And today's reading comes from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20, verses 17 to 38. Please follow along in your Bibles. I can hear many people turning them now, that's fantastic. But if you don't actually have a Bible of your own and you'd like to read along with us this morning, just place your hand up and one of the staff members will bring one to you. If you're following along in a church Bible, you'll find the passage on 902, page 902. Now this morning we're continuing our series in the book of Acts. Guided by the Holy Spirit, Paul is heading to Jerusalem, visiting key churches along the way. So we're starting in Acts chapter 20, verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you, night and day, with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Brothers and sisters and guests, good morning and welcome. Uh, great to have you here at Norwest this morning. Pete Stedman is my name, part of the ministry team, uh, and just a joy to be able to uh, open Acts chapter 20 uh, with you today. It'd be enormously helpful for you uh, to have Acts 20 open in front of you. You'll then see uh, that what I'm saying is actually what God's Word says first. Uh, I think that'll help us all. Let me start by asking a uh, question this morning. What do you think... A pastor's job is. Ever thought about that? I have. <laughs> Might be pleased to know. Uh, what, what do you think my job is? Well, why do I ask? To be honest, it's a slower week this week and I'm just looking for some ideas for, uh, for later in the week. No, that's not true at all. That's not true. But it is interesting because when I speak to people who are foreign to church which is actually most of our community and culture more and more, uh, and they find out that I'm a minister, there has been a number of times people have asked me what I do the other five days of the week. 
Fair question, right? Fair question. Obviously, I tell them I play golf, but, um, <laughs> but is that true? Now, here's the question for us today. What is a pastor's job? I reckon if I was to ask you all to write down on a post-it note the five top things that you think a pastor should do, and then I was to collate them all, I reckon I would get uh, a list of around 100 different things. So I reckon that's to say there's probably a fair bit of difference in our minds about what the role of a pastor is, whilst at the same time I reckon there would be a fair bit of overlap as well. Now the reason we start by thinking about this today is because today we come to this really delightful part of Acts, which is chapter 20. Uh, I haven't preached on it before in a church uh, and I've loved spending time in it this week. What it is, Acts 20, is Paul's farewell to the leadership, to the elders of the church in Ephesus, modern-day Turkey. And I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't heard this preached on before either, and I'll tell you why. It's because when a pastor sits down to write a sermon series, this is one of those sections that is easy to leave out because it's written to pastors. And so I think the way that our thinking will often go with this is, look, people can read this in their own time. There's probably not too much in there uh, for, for the church itself. Maybe their community group could look at it and so on and so forth. I want to say that actually this is really important for every one of us to look at, understand and take on board. Uh, and I trust by the end of our time together that you'll see why that is. All right, so Acts 20, let's have a look at this chapter. Where are we up to? Well, last week, James preached, and James opened up with Paul in Athens at the Areopagus in chapter 17. Chapter 18, Paul leaves Athens and heads down the road to Corinth. He stays in Corinth 18 months, preaching the word of God there. Paul then moves on from Corinth uh, and travels to a number of places until in chapter 19, we read, he arrives in Ephesus. Now, he comes and goes a bit from Ephesus, but we hear that he spends at least three years serving the church there. Three years of proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus, of working with the elders of the church. Actually, he's probably in Ephesus longer than he is anywhere else in the book of Acts. And our story today, our passage tells of the final meeting between Paul and and the leadership or the elders of the church in Ephesus, as Paul is now about to leave them and head to Jerusalem, Paul has a feeling he'll never see these people again. So in many ways, these are his last words to the church. Now, I'm sure you realise that last words are the most important words. Right now uh, in the Stedman household, uh, I'm working with my children on turning lights off as they leave a room. Do I give up now? Uh, I don't know. I, I know with me you understand how important that is. Global warming. You know, it costs sense if you leave that on. Do you not understand kids? You know. But here's the thing. I won't be talking to my kids on my deathbed about the lights they've left on. Final words draw out the most important things, and we're going to set them together. All right, now, uh, Paul, what's the first thing we see here? In many ways, what we see Paul speak to these uh, elders in the church about won't surprise us. In many ways, what he does is he lays out his ministry strategy and his approach for being an apostle in the church of God. And what we'll see as you read Acts 20 at the highest level is everything he says is about Jesus Christ. As I said, no surprise. Everything he says here, everything he shows us here is about knowing Jesus through the word of God. Knowing Jesus through the word of God. Let me show you. Verse 20, see that? Paul says, I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful. Verse 27, he says pretty much the same thing slightly differently. He says, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. So as Paul looks back on his three years, as he's shepherded the elders in this church, he speaks of the way here that he never withheld the truth. Hard things, difficult things, controversial things, he taught it all. He never gave in to the temptation to water down the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Now, verse 21, he then gives an example of a difficult and controversial thing, an area where Paul must have felt the temptation to water it down. Have a look. He says, I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. You see, Paul's ministry, we learn here, has been one of proclaiming the radical equality 
between Jews and Greeks and the radical need of both Jews and Greeks to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would this have been controversial, friends? Think about it. The the pressure Paul must have felt as a Jew born on the eighth day, uh, a Pharisee, the temptation to see a superiority between Jews and Greeks must have been huge for him. But at the centre of Paul's ministry, always and everywhere, was the need for all people everywhere to repent of their sin and to turn back to Jesus in trust, to have faith in Jesus. You do know, don't you, that the temptation to water down the gospel is ever present for every one of us. The gospel, that sinful people are so lost that they can never get to God. The gospel, that no amount of self-help, self-improvement, self-esteem will ever make us the people we want to be. The gospel, that the only hope a desperate people have is that God himself will take the initiative. God himself will reach out and rescue a people who are completely undeserving of his love, a people who stumble in the dark. But lies flash through our minds. And we are tempted to believe, are we not, that people aren't wicked, they're wounded. People aren't sinful, they're sick. People aren't rebellious, they're just ignorant. And even as I say that, some of you squirm a little. I squirm a little as I say it, actually. So I'm so thankful to Paul for his great clarity and his model of gospel ministry given in Acts 20. The first thing we see is that Paul will preach the whole will of God and keep nothing back. Now look at verse 24. This is what he says. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. What was that on the screen? The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. See that last part? What was Paul's task as an apostle? What is the model he's leaving the church in Ephesus as he moves on? That they testify, that he testified to the good news of God's grace. Here's the question. What is this grace thing Paul speaks about? that Al mentioned as he started the service today, that you might have noticed that we talk about here at Norwest quite a bit. Well, it's absolutely tied in to what I just said before because what I just said before is that one of the hard parts of the gospel that I'm tempted to water down is the fact that humans, creatures, people, all people are so sinful that we can never make our way to get right with God. There's not enough sacrifices we can make, dollars we can give, good works we can perform. We are utterly hopeless. And it's at this point that this word crashes in because the word grace means the love of God shown to the unlovely. The love of God shown to the unlovely. The kindness of God shown to those who don't deserve it. The the light of God poured out to those in the dark. The forgiveness of God given to those stuck in sin. Grace describes God's approach to us where he welcomes us with a welcome that the unwelcome do not deserve. And notice how Paul teaches this in verse 24. Do you see this? That actually this summary in 24 is the summary of his whole ministry. All Christian ministry, all his preaching and proclaiming and testifying, everything he did was speaking about testifying to the good news of God's Grace. And there you can see where the emphasis falls in the gospel. Yes, we're sinners. Yes, we're lost. Yes, we are deserving of the judgment of God. But the message is not called the bad news about our sin because the message is not primarily about us and our state. It's not about us. It's always about God and his approach to us, what he does for us. So the Christian message is always called the good news of God's grace. Isn't that delightful to see? Amazing. 
But then we see a bit more. He says it again in verse 32, but he adds something as well. So in verse 32, he says to the church elders, now notice this, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. That's a shorthand way of Paul saying to these leaders who he's going to leave, I'm leaving you to God and to his promise that he loves the unlovely. I'm trusting you into that. And then see what he says, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Man, I love this. If you slow down to see what he's saying, I love this. Paul is saying to this church, to these pastors, to these elders, he's saying the power to keep you going in the Christian life, the power for pastors and the power for people is to never forget God's love for the unlovely. Never walk past that. Never move on from. Never grow out of the hope of grace poured out for you. It's that truth, Paul's saying, that reality, that approach of God to you, undeserving, unbelievable, that will power, that will empower your Christian life. Do not grow weary of hearing and speaking about the grace of God. It will build you up. It will grow you up. It will encourage you and it will ensure that you have your place amongst those God has set apart. But there's one more thing here, critical, that we see. And this is at the heart of Paul's apostolic message. This is what was at the heart of all Paul's ministry that he wants to leave with the church. It actually holds the pieces together. What have we seen so far? On the one hand, Paul's preaching highlights that no one can find God. On the other, we find out that God is so kind and full of grace. How do those two things fit together? The answer is in verse 28. Can you see that? Paul here, speaking to pastors, he says this. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Now, there's a lot in there. I just want to point out two things. Here's what I, here's what I want us to see today. Firstly, the church is the possession of God. He made it his by shedding his own blood. The church, this church is not yours. It's not mine. It belongs to the creator of the heavens and the earth. The church, this church, is the personal possession of God alone and he made it his at great price. That was the death of his son. That was Jesus' death on the cross 2,000 years ago on a lonely hillside outside Jerusalem. And I wonder now if you can see how those two pieces fit together. How can an unlovely, undeserving people ever receive the kindness and love and forgiveness of a gracious God? Well, it's only and ever because the church was bought with God's own blood. Because only at the cross, Jesus made a way, Jesus made the way for for sinners to be reconciled back to himself, for the lost to be found, for the wicked to be forgiven. That is the single best picture of love for the unlovely, the single clearest picture of what grace is that you'll ever see. Friends, what's my job? It's pretty simple, really. (laughs) It is to remind us all of our desperate need for forgiveness from a holy God. It's to speak always of the grace that that holy God loves to pour out. And it's to show us all how it's only at the cross of Jesus that that remarkable transaction can ever occur. So do you see that I'm actually not free to lead this church however I want? I'm not free to teach here whatever I want. I can only lead here and teach here in God's church delightfully constrained by what God says about all things in his word. Okay, here's the thing. That's half my job. That's half my job. And it's a significant half, but I wonder if you notice that as significant as what Paul teaches, the content of what Paul teaches It's not all that he did. There was another whole side to what Paul did, to how Paul pastored. And it wasn't what he said. It was how he lived. Okay? And so 
One of the things we see in Acts 20 is not just the content of the gospel, that's crystal clear, we've seen that, but it's also how pastors are to live. Not just what they're to say. Actually, what we learn here is they are two sides of one coin. And in a sense, the easy part is the content. That's the easy part for me to get up here and accurately, correctly remind you of what the Bible says. That's the simple element. Now, the harder part is what's to come now. And let me tell you why this is really important for you to look at this. Because maybe you're thinking, just, mate, save it for the pastor's conference. If it's for pastors, why are you talking to us about it? Well, I'll tell you why. Three reasons. Here's the first. This is for pastors. But this is actually for all involved in pastoral ministry. So if you are a community group leader here at North West, or if you are part of our care team with Jody, or a kids ministry leader or helper, or a youth leader, or even one of our staff, then this speaks to you. Paul shows us here how we are to live as we lead. There's a lot in the room who this impacts. Secondly, by choosing to belong to Norwest Anglican, you choose to make a decision to sit under a particular shape and style of pastoring, of shepherding, of leadership. And it seems to me that it would be very prudent for you to have considered what sort of shepherds you sit under. Linked to that is the fact that one day I'll move on or you'll move on, but none of us will be here forever. And so one day you're actually going to need to make a decision about what sort of pastor you want to lead this place or what sort of pastor you want to sit under in another place. That's no small decision. Thirdly, Acts 20 gives you a framework by which you can both determine and assess the shape of my pastoring, the shape of our pastoring here at North West, the shape of any pastoring that you see in any church. It will help you answer the question, the question that you must ask. You have to ask this. Are our pastors faithful? Because you have to know that to be able to hold your pastors to account. And we've all seen, even in our own area, have we not, what happens when pastors are not held to account. And if they are not like this, if our pastors here are not like this or growing to be like this, don't you stay. You deserve much better elsewhere. All right. I got you listening, didn't it? Let's see what we see. What does Paul show us about the way he pastors in God's church? How does he go about his ministry? Four things. They're very brief. I'll point them out to you. Firstly, there is a delightful transparency to Paul's life. A delightful transparency to his life. It's in verse 18. See that? You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. You see, you can only ever say that if people saw you living amongst them. What Paul is saying here is that there was a consistency between what he said and how he lived. What you saw was what you got. With Paul, there was integrity, consistency, and transparency. Secondly, Paul's pastoring is both emotionally engaged and available. Verse 20, he says, I publicly, I taught publicly and from house to house. That is, Paul knew where his people lived. He spent time in their homes. He loved them so much he visited them. Verse 31, he says, Remember that for three years I never stopped warning you with tears. Paul was emotionally available and invested in the people he served. And then I wonder if you notice that delightful editorial note right at the end, verse 37, where it said, They all wept as they embraced Paul and kissed him. That's so lovely, isn't it? There's this warmth and love that flows between pastor and people. Paul is emotionally engaged and available. Thirdly, Paul pastored in brokenness and humility. Verse 19, we read that I served the Lord, says Paul, with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know, Paul found ministry really difficult. It brought him to his knees. It brought him to tears. It humbled him. He learned that God was God and he was not. 
He was severely tested and yet he persevered for he was humble, frail, yet faithful. And the last thing we see is that Paul pastored without self-interest, without self-interest. Verse 24, we see uh, that compared to the task he's given by the Lord Jesus, his life's worth nothing. Verse 33, he says, I didn't covet anyone's gold or silver. That is, Paul wasn't in ministry for money or comfort. Verse 34, 35, he said, I supplied my own needs. He modelled what he saw in Jesus, a life given to serving, not taking. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Even as I point these out to you from Acts 20, I feel the size of the gap growing between Paul's pastoring and my own. What do we do with that? It's worth pointing out that this is what pastors should long to be like, what we pray we become, recognising that we're not the finished product by a long shot. The, The question that you have to wrestle with is this. Is the trajectory there? Do we see that shape of Paul, that form, that shadow of these things in our pastors, in our leaders, in our church? Let me ask you a question, and I want to finish with this. Why do you think Paul lived like this? Actually, I'm going to ask you a different question. Where do you think Paul learned to live like this? Where did Paul learn to live with integrity, consistency, and transparency. It was in Jesus who lived the most transparent life with his disciples for three years. Where did Paul learn to be emotionally engaged and available to his people? It was in Jesus who, when he met his beloved friend Mary at her brother's funeral, simply wept. Where did Paul learn to minister the gospel in weakness and humility? It was in Jesus who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And where did Paul learn that pastoring God's people was not about self-interest? It was in Jesus who had not a place to lay his head. You know, one of the most compelling things about Jesus Christ was the remarkable integrity between who he was and what he said, between who he was and what he did. Utterly compelling. And it always has been. The greater the integrity, the greater the alignment and the consistency between the words of Jesus' followers and the lives of Jesus' followers, the more compelling they are as people and the more compelling the good news that they speak. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, is remarkably compelling. He lives what he preaches. It challenges us. It draws us in. It makes us want to be like him. And so it is for every Christian who has followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, the gospel of grace has to be seen in lives of grace. And when there is a disjuncture between words and lives, that rightly leads to a sense of inauthenticity or hypocrisy. And both of them are like poison to the gospel of grace. And so, friends, and to finish on this, I just want you to draw someone to mind right now. Draw someone to mind. I want you to draw to mind that person who most deeply impacted you in your walk with Jesus, that person who most impacted you as you grew to love Jesus. Draw that to mind. I bet you they look like Paul. I bet you they look like this. They they spoke the gospel to you. They ministered the gospel to you. They kept none of the gospel from you. And they shared their lives with you. They loved you. They were kind to you. They were humble and gracious and good. Praise God that he put someone like that in your life. Pray to God that he might make you someone like that to be put in someone else's life. Let us pray.
Good and gracious Heavenly Father, none of your word is only for a subset of your people and Acts 20 is not for pastors alone, it's for every one of us. For we are all sheep and your son is the true shepherd. Father, will you help us be a people who understand that the grace you've poured out to us is not for us alone, but it then overflows from us. Father, we bring a consistency between what we say and who we are and one that glorifies the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.